I'm Oliver Gao. I'm the director of Cornell Systems and Engineering uh, System and Engineering Program, and we will be conducting this system conversation series today. I'm very uh, delighted to have Professor Stratus uh, Pistikopoulos, and who is a distinguished research professor in the RT McFerrin Department of Chemical Engineering at Texas A&M University, and I know that he was uh, the professor of chemical engineering at Imperial College London and the director of the Center for Process System Engineering. Strata, it's very great to have you today. And I think uh, I was reading you know, your, uh, your bio and also the abstract of the talk you are going to give today at our Ezra System Seminar Series. Uh, there is a long list of your achievements. However, I think for our conversation, I would like to start by inviting you to talk more about yourself, your research, your career, because I think this series is also targeting our system and inner students. Like, yeah. you know, they will learn from your career, your, your experience. I'm very happy to be yeah. here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm a truly systems engineer, both in, uh, uh, in thinking and in practice. I, did, uh, I started uh, my career as a I mean, chemical engineer yeah. by training. I did my undergraduate studies back home in Greece, in Thessaloniki. Then I went to Carnegie Mellon uh, to do my PhD studies uh, in the so-called process systems engineering area, which is really the systems engineering component of chemical engineering, but it's really like an applied mathematics, OR, computer science, gelled all together with applications to engineering science and so forth. And then from there on, I went and I spent three years at Shell in Amsterdam, uh, working at uh, supply chain and control problems related to the oil, primarily and gas business at that time. And then I moved in 1991 at Imperial College, where I spent 24, 25 wonderful years there. And then um, after, you know, completing my, what I thought, my cycle of academic kind of things at, in Europe and in London, I thought, you know, uh, it would be good for me to challenge, so I was looking for another challenge in my life, and I thought uh, leading the Energy Institute at Texas a &M is a good enough uh, challenge because, you know, Texas, as you know, plays people are role in the oil and gas business, but at the same time, it's big, uh, you know, major, um, uh, a lot of huge emphasis on weed, so there, it's, a, it's a nice solar place at all as well, so I thought, an energy institute in the capital of the energy space within the US and arguably the world might give me the extra dimension I was looking for. So, and that's where I have been for the last almost three years now. So, and my research is, uh, I would say, I'm basically a mathematical modeler. So my view of the world is, I look at engineering systems, physical systems, all the way to, you know, systems of systems, as mathematical ontologies, if you wish, you know, so either through first principles, also through data or the interplay, like hybrid models, kind of. And then instead of doing real experiments on the real systems, you conduct virtual experiments on the in silico type of systems, if you wish. And then you ask what if questions for energy, energy efficiency, how can I improve operational excellence, all these kind of things. And one particular area of my expertise is like on optimization under uncertainty, where, you know, so because when you play with multi scales and all this, very often the only thing we know is that we don't know enough. So, so modeling uncertainty and then studying the impact on uncertainty on optimization plays crucial role. So I have been developing over the years the field of what is called multi-parametric optimization where in a nutshell is, we're not only interested in one solution that is, fits all the scenarios of uncertainty, but we're trying to explore the space of possibilities in the parameter space and how we can optimize based if you wish on observing the realization of the parameters in an optimal way. It's like playing chess in a way. So you're trying in silico to predict all the moves of your opponent based on hypothetical scenario of the opponent. Obviously, you don't want to do it all exhaustively up to the end. You do it like multiple steps. So it mimics this type of approach. And then it's interesting that the major application of this kind of optimization under a certain theory has been found in model predictive control, which is like a 
control through optimization, pretty much. And we managed there to squeeze model predictive control technology instead of doing it successively in real time online. So we pre compute the solutions in a multi-parametric optimization fashion, and then the solution can be even encoded with a microchip or could be part of a software system. So it gets some very nice applications. I will show later on in yeah. my lecture some applications we have done even on hybrid cars or in hydrogen economy for fuel cells, metal hydride uh, storage and so forth. So we try to close the loop from mathematical theory all the way to engineering application and demonstration of this. So, so that's kind of where I'm coming from. I really admire, like, you know, as a great researcher, you, you are not only doing this kind of fundamental mathematical, like a proof or risk. However, you really see the value of bringing the whole thing to the application on the engineering side. So you, you know, your background was in chemical engineering yeah. and you've been doing this kind of control. So when you thought about your next stage and in the end you picked this energy institute. So what do you view as the key challenge in energy systems? Very good question. Excellent. Yes, I think this is something obviously it's in my mind every day, right? You know, and yeah. uh, I mean, first of all, energy systems, I think the key word is systems, as you mentioned. So let me start first by saying that energy by nature is one of the most interdisciplinary, you know, kind of research. So it poses interdisciplinary research questions that a single domain cannot answer by itself, right? And uh, so, and number two is, especially because of this, you've got to create an ethos and mentality and put research programs in place where people create interdisciplinary teams to tame and address the complexity of the energy systems of the future, right? So, so and that entails not only technologies, right? You know, so I have, uh, I have found like, the new fuel cell or I have created the new, a system for uh, reserve or managing like an engine and so forth. But it's also, you have to look at bridging the various scales like materials and nanomaterials play a key role. Mm -hmm. uh, I was talking earlier to Professor Archer at your own energy systems uh, group and, uh, uh, and it's clearly the interplay, like take batteries as an example, it's a beautiful example where we, there is beautiful work on cathodes, on anons, on electrolytes, on the cell of a battery, but a battery is a system, right? And you've got to take a holistic approach. And never two batteries operate exactly the same, even if it's exactly the same, because the, the reliability, component, the way they want. So creating this systems, this holistic approach to the analysis of energy systems of the future requires to create also infrastructures within a university where this can be cultivated and catalyzed properly. And the role of the Energy Institute at Texas A&M is precisely this, to bring together the policy people, the financial people, the technologists, the agricultural people, the science people, the engineers, even the school of law. So even the school, of, you know, like, because very often we don't fully understand how, or at least we, our students and, all of us, because we have been trained vertically, we do not fully understand the horizontal aspects of how the energy space of the future will not be only a function of technology, will not be only a function of materials, will be a function as well of materials at the nanoscale, materials at the mesoscale, at technologies at the meso mega scale of the supply chains, but also of the policy, the law, the financial aspects, all this interlinked together. So this, and we have created an educational program towards that direction, which is very interesting. It's a 10 month fast track master in science, where the objective is not to go in depth because they are all people who have already graduated. They have their in depth kind of vertical type of education, but we're trying to create thinkers and leaders of energy for the future who are, have this in breadth they can take this in breadth tech approach to analyzing 
in a, on, a quanti, on quantitative grounds, and I emphasize quantitative, not really qualitative, mm -hmm. on quantitative grounds, scenarios of energy for the f now, medium term, and for the future. So we trade this. So it's a 10-month fast-track program of non-interlinked modules, sequential, one after the other. So where people, you know, our students are exposed to from smart grids to technology, to optimize modeling and optimization, but also to entrepreneurship, law and energy, the role of financing, international policy, and how it affects energy over the, you know, over the time horizon and so forth. So all these kind of aspects. That's great. And that's really, I think, a very good reflection of, you know, this, as you mentioned, this multi-scale systems. Energy approach. systems, uh, multi-scale yeah. systems is linked to energy, to the analysis of energy systems, absolutely. Yeah, that's true. So kind of in, in that sense, and I really appreciate that you mentioned not only, you know, the battery, the details of you know, the chemical details of battery, but really you go all the way to law. Absolutely. Right? So, so in that sense, um, like applying the control method that you have developed, probably like we already developed the control methodology to target a specific process or product. Now imagine if you develop or if you apply all this, you know, model predict control, model based predict control, like all the way to also include the legal as a policy aspect. What what are the challenges can do you see for the control of very, our societal system towards energy sustainability. Very good, very good point. I mean, let me also add to the previous point that you made um, that um, I'm also a great believer that uh, this kind of interdisciplinary big centers and so forth, I don't see any contradiction between doing yourself a fundamental research and having a strong fundamental research program and be leading this activity because you've got to be leading by example. So I'm a great believer of doing, you know, leading the community. So let me come back now to your control problem. Uh, we are targeting our real, one of the key reasons you want control, as you know, in uh, multi-scale systems application, is moving towards real-time optimization, right? You know, so improving um, on real-time the performance, the energy efficiency, the, you know, so moving the operation of systems towards more sustainable and affordable and energy efficient and financially more effective systems. All right. So the means to achieve this is how you control the decrease of freedom in the system, right? Which usually you freeze through advanced control. So that's the role of modern predictive control. Now, so, so the policy issues, other issues, this, uh, beyond economics, be, or, or including economics, including energy, the policy issues, like you know, like what different stakeholders and stakeholders may lead, you can include them in, let's say, in a mathematical context, like a multi-objective type of framework, right? Mm -hmm. And the end, you know, we can analyze this type of optimization problems, right? This large scale, model-based optimization systems where you have different actors competing with each other, which is like the, you know, policy X competing with policy Y, we can analyze and we can see from a control perspective, what is the optimal control strategy or so that goes towards one policy versus another policy, we can analyze. That's very important, you know, from a quantitative decision making policy point of view. But also, we can also pose the question, can we divide strategies? that trade off those, or like robustify, or somehow, you know, trying to average the effects of various competitive views on how we run a system. So, so I believe in, in a nutshell that control and towards real-time optimization can play a vital role in offering quantitative decision-making tools mm -hmm. to the decision-makers on how to shift optimally the operation of any system from a micro to the meso to the mega scale, how it can shift the optimal operation towards achieving, achieving those potentially conflicting objectives or a multitude of objectives. Yeah, that's true. It's better kind of when you go from one scale to another scale where you introduce more stakeholders. And especially, I think, in Texas, right? You know, you, that's, that's a kingdom 
of energy. However, that's a kind of energy where you have both the conventional energy source. Yes. And also now you're talking about solar energy. I know the kind of, you know, the Texas... The wind in particular, which Texas play a key role. You know, 12% even more of the energy generation of Texas comes from wind. So mm -hmm. wind is very big. 12%. I'll give 12, 12, you know, for the electricity generation, 12, going all the way to 15, and there are even projections to go to 20%. So, you know, wind plays, and solar is becoming key as well. You know, the, there are major pilot projects now on introducing solar in this. I'll give you an example of uh, a project we're give, doing in uh, the San Antonio space, mm -hmm. which is mostly related on uh, showing the interactions of systems of systems. Mm -hmm. It's on the food, energy, water, and uh, let's say waste, nexus kind of thing. So San Antonio is a city. I mean, this is one of our infused, it's an NSF project. Infused, we're working with uh, agricultural financiers, uh, people and uh, colleagues who specialize on water resources and so forth. And we, the energy is to the other hand. San Antonio, so here is the dilemma that, you know, this uh, triangle of, uh, let's say, the nexus of its offering. You have on the one hand a city which is growing fast. So San Antonio now is an example, it's reaching 2.5 million people, so and it's growing. So it's uh, Then around San Antonio you have an agricultural bell, if you were belt, right? You know, and then further along this intermixed you have a huge number of wells, for sale, gas, and so forth, of various markets. So it's not that one has it all, you know, so there are different operators, and which are consuming tremendous amount of water. So, so you have agriculture competing from water, you have the wells competing from water, and then you have a thirsty city that is competing for good quality water, right? You know, same time energy, you're competing from an energy sector because you know, they're, you know, the city has electricity, you know, needs, uh, power needs, the, the whole agricultural production requires power and, you know, the wells obviously are, elect you know, they are uh, power, they are, uh, need uh, power generation, they are and pretty much they are producing the means to, for power and electricity, right? So, and then you have all those regulators. So you have the city planners, you have the regulators and policy makers for electricity, for water, the people, the well operators, the agricultural, you know, so, so how do you put some, you know, so how you manage the complexity of a system, as complex, which is completely unregulated, and in Texas, you know, we want less and less regulation, so, yeah. and how you make quantitative decisions on analyzing scenarios of the future, because obviously water is scarce in Texas, so are you going to bring it from desalination plants, from the Gulf Coast, but then you have a huge pipe, uh, pipe water pipeline with huge investment, and we're talking billion, and you know, and uh, uh, a lot of energy consumption to pump the water, so you know, what are the alternatives, right? So, that's where a systems, a holistic approach to the analysis of the nexus is so crucial. And that's an example of excellence where different policy makers, policy holders, shareholders and stakeholders can be brought in because if you provide to them quantitative decision-making tools that can analyze, the hope is that they can look at them a little bit more seriously and then learn to, you know, there's a training part as well, you know, to, to, we need to train them to be able to look at those quantitative tools and make much more informed quantitative based decisions. So that's an example where the ecosystem, systems of systems come together. That's true, like, you know, as researchers, right, we, you know, we discover new science, we develop quantitative tools, and then these tools can be used to support, exactly. uh, you know, the decision maker. Of course, I think from uh, for the energy uh, challenge, especially as researchers, a lot of times uh, we focus on the supply side. Yes. You know, we focus on the technology innovation. We focus on improving the efficiency of existing systems, right? However, you know, energy system, it's really, energy market, it's like a mobility market. It's really, it's a consumer driven, right? So in that case, if you think of the whole thing, also including the consumers that demand, how do you control a system? Because otherwise, if we always focus on producing energy, 
but without looking at okay. how people are using that. Okay. So how but, do you incorporate this whole demand side also into your whole holistic That's control? That's excellent point. I mean, this is something that um, uh, we're working on the supply chain, perhaps, you know, empowering through optimization and control technologies, but uh, you are sp spot on, you know, the energy system should be looked both on the supply chain as well as on the demand side. It also should be looked at uh, also distributed or centralized systems, distributed systems. Do I go towards directions where I do in situ production of energy and power? And how do I do this? So, so my research, if you wish, uh, direction on this is, and what we are here as systems engineers, if you wish, mm -hmm. is to be able to analyze scenarios. I don't want us to take a position that technology X or supply chain Y is the route to the success for the energy scenarios of the future, but I would like us to play the role that we provide quantitative tools that depict based on changing demand scenarios mm -hmm. on the demand side what will be the te optimal technology fix mix, especially as technologies are evolving as a function of time? Mm -hmm. So what are those optimal mix will look like as we go forward under both technology uncertainty, customer demand uncertainty, under the scenario of both distributed and fully centralized system. So that's a wonderful, let's say, systems optimization problem, which offers opportunity. It's really very close to the earlier discussion we had, like how you manage behavior of fleet, right? You know, like autonomous yeah. systems of uh, ecosystems in the smart cities. Similar, the analogies, the, what are the smart systems, how you run, how you analyze intelligent scenarios, scenarios of intelligent energy ecosystems of the future, you know? So so we be, so the approach we take for this is, obviously, you need to rely on data, so build forecasting scenarios and so forth. But we, we develop, let's say, supply chain models, large-scale supply chain models, where we aggregate, so you don't want to carry the complexity of the model at any, like, at any scale, if you wish. So we aggregate the models. We solve these large-scale optimization problems under conditions of uncertainty. And then at lower level, we focus in and we say, can we deliver this now? So can we really run these scenarios, you know, so these technologies all the way to controlling them? So, you know, we zoom by zooming. So we're reaching in the stage of not only multi-scale like multi modeling, but also multi-scale optimization even of supply chains, where we can zoom in, zoom out at the various levels of complexity of the model instances that we generate to create viable scenarios under uncertainty and then assess the impact of uncertainty or the solutions of these problems. And that's where control and optimization can play a role as we evolve, because obviously this will be from a real-time operational point of view, there will be like residing horizon type of policies, right? You're not going to switch automatically from technology A to B. Yeah, I think that's exactly like you, know, you talk about and when we talk about demand side, of course that kind of get closer to uh, you know my research transportation because now we, when we talk about the future of transport and we are talking about, when people say, when people talk about three revolutions, we talk shared use, like the Uber type, yes. shared use, autonomous driven, electric vehicles, so in that case, in the future, in the transportation will essentially become a part of your energy system. It's, it's essential, it's become an appliance. Yes. So, so in that case, how, like what's your view about like, you know, all the control, you know, when you look at this energy system, assuming, imagining a scenario where you have coupled energy and a transport system. These two systems are completely coupled together yeah. and on the top, there is a control. Yes. First of all, the way I view the particular technology that we're developing on the parametric control side, like uh, exp this explicit control strategies, is particularly suitable for an appliance-driven society and economy. So because it empowers uh, the local intelligence of the autonomous you know, subsystems, right? That's because, right. So because how you create autonomicity of a single vehicle. First of all, you, in order to create autonomicity, 
uh, you need autonomicity of uh, every element of the node, let's say, of the agent, mm -hmm. let's say, right? So that's where this should be uh, empowered with intelligent control systems. So that's application number one, if you wish. Now, at the scenario that you postulated, also there's going to be, so based that every sub uh, node of the system will be intelligent enough, empowered by this uh, intelligent advanced control technology, then you, at the higher level, you need to, if you wish, some, uh, if you, uh, some um, uh, supply chain management, if you wish, like so agent could be done in different ways. So you like so, some optimization strategy, coordinate to coordinate the different agents and actors and uh, appliances. So, so the scenario of the future that I see, first of all, is I agree that uh, we're going towards an electrification strategy. I'm also, th I'm also an advocate of hybrid scenarios so that maybe the world is not going to only go towards only a battery-based electrification scenario. We might have also in situ production of uh, carriers, you know, of uh, like uh, electrons or fuels, like for instance, onboard fuel cells, like hybrid technologies or other type of technologies. So in that hybrid type of energy scenario where appliances, transportation systems, cars, cities are all integrated and you know, so and you're producing on demand in situ power and electricity, I think the role of control and model-based control in particular and managing the data that we generate again in developing control studies is becoming more and more important. Yeah, and, and also you got more powerful. I think earlier you mentioned it's kind of fundamental research application, and especially as researchers, one key product could be like a software. Yes. And I was reading, you have this Parrock software. Can you tell uh, us more about the, the software and how that can be used? Yes. Uh, actually, I'm proud that uh, not only I'm uh, passionate about research and closing the loop into engineering applications, but I'm also I'm a great uh, advocate of entrepreneurship type of uh, activities. So I have been involved over the years in two major, let's say, spin-off activities. One is completely on the software side. So uh, I'm a co-founder of uh, Process Systems Enterprise Limited, which is a UK-based company on the software side. So we are developing, so the company is developing the, a dynamic simulator called Ziproms, that is used now in 250 plus industrial partners. So it's a spin-off company that now involves 200 people all around the world. So it's a very successful enterprise. Also with presence in the United States, New Jersey and Houston. That's great. So, and, uh, so that's mostly on the software side. So it's a modeling, model-based technology. So, and then on the control side, which also paves the ways to real-time control based on models, right? So on the other hand, like this Paros uh, is, let's say, uh, so I patented the technology, like squeezing the MPC, and like from optimization to devices, like uh, microchips and software-based. And uh, what we do there is we develop software systems that based on which one can develop those controllers, right? You know, starting either from a high fidelity model or like say MATLAB-based environment or any software where you do the model, all the way to how you develop those explicit control expressions that you can download to a chip or to a software system uh, for uh, real-time optimization. And this technology transfer, I have patented. So we have a software at patents and uh, this spin-off uh, activity effectively is the hub, the home of all these kind of things. So we do a number of um, projects with uh, both at the research side, but also let's say exploring with uh, industrial colleagues and uh, partners, the application of this to industry. I will show you later on a couple of examples that we have done in the past, one with uh, a, an air separation company, like on empowering small air separation units, 
um, a second one from an example in uh, Formula One, you know, so because I'm, I like, you know, so I thought this is a particular good technology for speeding up the control actions for cars and so forth. Uh, and um, also some uh, recent work we do with the pharmaceutical companies. So, you know, so again, uh, powering uh, uh, advanced control technologies where you don't want to uh, re-optimize every step of the way. So you have, let's say, a table of solutions and you just, in real time, you only read solutions, like a Google type of set. So it's a very interesting technology and uh, I hope it will also become, you know, uh, you know, a brand name. Even coming back to, like you said, that, you know, you were thinking about next challenge you would like to take on, right? I think as researchers and actually anyone, like we, we want to do research, you know, we want to write papers, but we want our papers to have impact. We want our research to have impact. And I think one critical way to have impact is really closely connected to the real world, right? You ha- I, I'm really admired that you say you have had two very successful you know, experience starting up to yes. different spin-offs. Yes. yes, clearly we are, yes, absolutely. As researchers, we would, long, we would like to unlock things that we don't know already, you know, so that's a beautiful thing to do, you know, and uh, research is all about challenging the current status quo and uh, putting questions and address questions of the future, like creating new, ener- like discovering new energy solutions, kind of. And then we should not forget the application side, absolutely. So we need to be able to close from fundamental research the loop, going back to create relevance, being into engineering, being into other you know, sectors, closing this loop. That's very important and uh, we should not forget this. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I think uh, instruments and establishments and organizations like the energy issue that we have at Texas a and aims in A, creating new research views for discovery of novel energy solution spaces, but also closing the loop, making it relevant to the society, you know, and uh, through uh, this technology transfer mechanisms and addressing real challenges that uh, a society will need to address for the future. I think that's one for actually, this is actually what you know, Cornell now is, uh, is emphasizing. For example, you know, for the, for the Cornell Tech Campus, you know, the whole theme is about entrepreneurship. Yes. But right? I think this is, this is great. I, I was looking at the time, probably right out of the time. It, it was really great. Thank yes. you very much. Thank yes. you for inviting me. It's great to be here. And I mean, it's um, yeah. so thank you very much. Yeah.